ladies and gentlemen, hello, and welcome back once again to The Briefing Room. My name is Eric Cavanaugh. I will be your host for today's webcast, and it's a wonderful topic we're talking about today, folks. So let me go ahead and jump right into our slide. There is a slide about yours truly and enough about me. As many of you know, the mission of the, of the Briefing Room is to reveal the essential characteristics of enterprise software. This stuff is complicated. We try to distill it on your behalf. And the way we do that is we pair innovative vendors with independent analysts for live analyst briefings. The vendor and analyst do not coordinate before the show. And the reason is because we want to preserve that kind of organic conversation that you only get in a first kind of call, like when an analyst takes a briefing from a vendor. The show was actually inspired several years ago now. We've been doing this for three years. We've done, I believe, over 100 and some of these things so far. And uh, it was inspired when I watched my partner, Dr. Robin Bloor, take a briefing from a vendor at a conference up in New York, and I was so impressed with how quickly he was able to bring out a very detailed and educational conversation. And I thought, boy, we need to can that and sell it. And so that's what we did, and it's called The Briefing Room. So the topic for today is a fascinating topic, folks. It is called Where the Warehouse Ends, a New Age of Information Access. Here you can see the uh, upcoming events. We do different topics each month. But uh, so let's talk about this for a second. The topic of the month is integration, and I wanted to share this little slide with you. The topic of today is where the warehouse ends, a new age of information access. And yes, indeed, that is a reference to the famous book of poetry by Shel Silverstein, Where the Sidewalk Ends. I don't know about you all, but I remember when I was a kid, that book really blew my mind. It just, it was a very powerful experience, and it really encouraged me to kind of think outside the box, I guess is a good way to put it. And I thought to myself, there are all kinds of ways this metaphor holds true when we're talking about things like data warehousing, big data analytics, as it's called, and this whole field of data integration. If you think about it, the sidewalk is there, and the sidewalk is kind of like the data warehouse. You know what to do with it. It's very clean. It's very organized. It's obvious what you do when you're walking on the sidewalk. You know where to go. Well, there's a point where the sidewalk ends, obviously, and I would argue these days that's this whole world of big data and big data analytics, and we're still in the very early stages of dealing with all that stuff. But the point is that traditional rules don't apply. You get off the sidewalk and you can go in any direction. There's grass, there are rocks, there are trees, there's all kind of stuff out there. It's not the same easily structured, square, relational sort of world that we're used to dealing with. So what does all that mean? Well, I can tell you this. Increasingly, you're going to see organizations looking for ways to incorporate big data with all this other traditional data that we have through the data warehouse, through OLAP cubes, and traditional sources like the enterprise resource planning systems, CRM systems, and so forth. And it's going to be a fun journey, I can tell you right now. So let me go ahead and push the next slide. Barry Devlin is calling in all the way from South Africa. We're very happy to have him online today. Composite software. These guys have been doing data virtualization about as long as anyone, over a decade, I believe. You can see it's a platform that unifies data from multiple disparate sources into a logical virtual data layer and readies data for consumption. So data virtualization is one approach for dealing with the integration needs, not just of data warehouse data, but also all these new interesting data sources. And as we're hearing, companies are starting to really move off a dime and get something done there. So we're very pleased to have the CTO himself, David Bessemer, online today for Composite Software. For over 25 years, David has architected and engineered leading-edge software technologies and companies. He's very happy to have his experience online today. And with that, I'm going to hand the keys of the WebEx over to Mr. Bessemer and David. Just click on that uh, slide and use the down arrow on your keys, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eric. It's good to be here today. Uh, thank you for having us. And uh, Barry, I look forward to the discussion. So it's interesting as we look at the metaphor of where the warehouse ends, um, I, you know, one of the things that people always say is, is that really happening and is it really possible? And I, I always want to start by saying the warehouse is such an important part of our data management practices and will continue to play a very important part. So it, not only is it necessary and valuable, um, but some changes are making it so that it's no longer sufficient. And that's really what we're talking about today when we have these discussions about um, where the warehouse ends. So let's first talk conceptually about uh, data and businesses and how, uh, how they fit together. 
everybody, of course, has um, more data than they can deal with today, and of course, it's growing even faster than ever before. Um, so we've all got lots of data. The difference between readers and followers is the ability to leverage the data to gain agility, save money, and ultimately beat the competition. So it's about being able to take advantage of your data in a way that advances your business. Uh, Gartner's research says that um, businesses that modernize their information management will display 20% higher performance than if they don't. Uh, last year, the Harvard Business Review published a report that said data-driven companies are 5% more productive than their competitors and 6% more profitable than their competitors. So the bottom line here is actually the bottom line, which is if you don't figure out how to leverage all of this data that's coming at you, your competitors will, and you'll get left behind. So it's both opportunity and peril. Now, the challenge, of course, is that this has always been hard, um, but it's, it's getting harder. If we look at the way uh, we've historically integrated data, um, we've used technologies like the data warehouse, and it was a place that business users could go to get all of their critical information to do visibility, uh, reporting, and even analytics. And the enterprise data warehouse has served its purpose very well, but even at its best, it's always been challenged by agility. Um, the Data Warehouse Institute estimates that it takes seven weeks to add uh, a new report on top of a warehouse. It takes eight weeks to add a new field to the data warehouse. So whether your practice is a little faster or a little slower than that, you're still talking about months to take a new piece or a new kind of data and make it a part of the visibility and analytics that you need to run your business. So um, if that wasn't bad enough, though, what's happened over the last um, decade is that the number and type of data sources has diversified. Um, on the left there, of course, you can see operational databases and enterprise applications. And for a long time, we've been able to get a lot of that data into the warehouse uh, with some live feeds and some other things. But as you start to look at the more recent types of data sources, um, both big data and then cloud resident sources, and of course, uh, the rise of third party uh, data for sale. It's not only not um, uh, desirable, but it's not possible to get all of that data into the warehouse. And so new technologies are needed in order to make uh, this data accessible. I mean, after all, having more data should be better. It should be good for the business. But the problem is it hasn't really worked out that way. Um, it's essentially added complexity and cost and reduced responsiveness. And, um, you know, there's a phrase that you're, you're data rich but information poor. And I think that that's the situation a lot of businesses find, uh, find themselves in. So as we look at the future, uh, composite software brings a data integration technology uh, called data virtualization that gives you immediate access to all of your data sources so that you can manage the data where you want it to naturally live and leave it there, leverage those uh, data management silos for what they're good for, and then use that data uh, in your business for visibility, operations, analytics, uh, and leverage that to get real value. So whether we're talking about cloud data, or big data or third-party data, which is on the rise, um, all of this data needs to be leveraged to empower you to gain better insights and, and, and compete better. Um, composite software, this is all we're focused on, and I'll talk a little bit more about our platform in a few minutes, um, but you, know, you don't have to take our word for it. There are hundreds of companies getting real value out of data virtualization today, and I can guarantee you that all of these businesses have strong data warehousing practices as well that work in conjunction with data virtualization. Now, one of the areas that I want to focus in on is to talk a little bit about how uh, data virtualization can help with the emerging needs of analysts. And of course, analyst is a fairly broad uh, group of people. It can range anywhere from very sophisticated um, data scientists doing um, very sophisticated mining and algorithmic exploration of data to 
product managers who simply want to find out um, which products are selling the best and why somebody left the website before they placed an order. So it really has a wide range of um, users in this class called analysts, but they all have a similar process to actually working with data. And that process looks a lot like this uh, six chevron pipeline where you're having to bring data together and then ultimately use that data to develop some business insight. The interesting part of this pipeline is that at least half of the time that analysts spend is on marshalling the data into a form and location that allows them to actually do the analysis that they started out to do. Half the time is spent on data integration. Right? The topic of this month's briefing rooms are all about integration, and if this isn't a problem right to be addressed, then, then I don't know what is. Um, and it's not good enough for them to just integrate the data and get it together in one place, because analytics by its very nature is all about iteration and experimentation and trying to find out whether there's a better way to look at the data. And as a result, you're always going back and getting more data and modifying the form of the existing data and essentially um, ma uh, making that data malleable into a form that serves your need at this particular moment. This is very difficult to do with traditional data integration technologies. It's very difficult to do when all you're getting is uh, batch feeds or overnight data integration. And so um, the analysts today are doing this by hook or by crook, um, but they're doing it through a variety of chewing gum and scotch tape and bringing things together and, in a lot of ways, um, going around IT to do it by building rogue data marts on their uh, desktop machines or creating spread marts. Um, you all know the drill out there. Um, uh, in some ways, analysts are like water on pavement. Um, they will find every crack to get at the data that they need to get their problem solved. Um, and, of course, that's part of the virtue of these analysts is their uh, dogged and determination to actually get some answer to the problem. So one of the things that we would like to uh, help these analysts with is addressing the data problem in a way that makes it easier gives them more agility, but also gives IT some control and some visibility into what's going on. And so through virtualization, you can actually, uh, we can actually help these analysts find the data and identify which data is appropriate for um, the analyst's uh, current need. We can help them connect to various types of sources, including big data sources, cloud data sources, um, and even third-party data sources that you might have to pay for and have a subscription for. And then ultimately bring that data together in a model that serves the current purpose or the current theory, the current exploration, and potentially materialize that data into a sandbox so that you can do some uh, torture queries on it and you know, maybe do a variety, of, maybe use a variety of different tools on it. And the idea is that the analyst doesn't have to spend as much time and energy actually integrating data as they spend on analyzing the data. Now, we've seen in our customers that um, using data virtualization to address the analytic uh, data problem takes two main forms. Um, one form is on the right, and I'll talk about that one first, which is uh, where you have IT essentially using virtualization to be more relevant and more agile so that they can serve the analyst data needs better. Um, by doing this, IT um, uh, becomes more involved in data management that the analysts are doing. The analysts don't have to do as much data integration, and they get their data sooner so that they can actually perform the analytics. Um, these analytic data hubs, as we've labeled them, are a practice that has evolved out of generalized data virtualization, but it's focused on um, the, the specific analytic needs. And what's nice about this is as these data needs are addressed through these analytic data hubs, um, IT can have some visibility into how this data is being used. It can also reuse this data as the analysis moves from exploration to actual insight 
to then operationalizing whatever those insights are. So there's a nice pipeline there that occurs with it. Now, over on the left is the second form of this, and this is a little bit more um, akin to how analysts already work, but by using data virtualization, they get to more easily integrate their data than doing it all by hand. Um, and this is more of a self-service analytic sandbox type arrangement where IT gives the analysts access to some of these virtualization tools and um, control over which data is available and allows them to actually integrate the data themselves and put together uh, some sandboxes and some, some uh, data sets that allow them to do uh, analysis that may or may not be something durable. Um, the main characteristic of this type of uh, analytic uh, data integration versus the analytic data hub is it's not clear whether this uh, data integration is one-off and it's a throwaway um, or whether it's something that might be used over time. And so it's nice to relieve IT of some of that churn and have the data analyst uh, with, who is often very competent at putting these integrations together uh, actually do it themselves. Um, now, you know, this isn't as easy as it could be, and I don't, uh, I'm not going to talk specifically about some of these things today, but we have a, a set of features in our lab that we're planning and bringing out this year that actually make this part of the um, analytic uh, data integration process much easier for the average analyst. Uh, so there's some exciting things to come there uh, in the composite pipeline. So as you think about bringing data together for analytics using this kind of technology, uh, you find benefits that are um, benefits that uh, are not only to the analyst but also to IT. So you certainly get faster time to analysis. Uh, when you had to do this in a traditional way, uh, where you had to potentially code ETL scripts and stand up a new data, data silo and establish a schema and populate it and, and iterate, it just wasn't as fast as you can do it in a virtual way. Um, the self-service data integration is really great for the analysts because they're empowered to go and get it done, but it's also great for IT because they become more of an enabler and actually don't have to be so directly involved in some of this temporary uh, data churn that goes on. And finally, over time, as you promote these analytic results uh, and operationalize them, you get improved data consistency and quality that you can share across uh, your operations, and there's a, a natural progression of data from the analyst tool to the, uh, the curated operationalized data set that the IT uh, data management staff typically manages. Okay. So, so we'll, let's take a look at some customer examples uh, in three different areas. Um, one is in um, sort of a competitive battleground. Um, this is, uh, these are two companies that are obviously household names. And um, the first one, Comcast, uses composite to access customer data to improve upsell. Um, so obviously a form of marketing analytics. They believe, and these are their numbers, they believe that they were able to add $20 million in $21 million in upsell revenue to their bottom line simply because they had timely access to all of their data through data virtualization. That's a pretty compelling number given that they did not pay anywhere near that amount for the software itself. Sony Entertainment Network, um, they actually leverage data virtualization to fine-tune product launches to do cross-selling. And so uh, they rolled out Call of Duty and other games um, their solution includes clickstream data that's stored in Hadoop, as well as traditional data silos like uh, SQL Server and Oracle. They believe they increased their PlayStation revenue by $9 million by having this software as part of their tool set. Again, a very significant number straight to the bottom line that gives them a competitive advantage. We talk a lot about agility. and if you think about the most common word that you've read in the trade press over the last year, it might just be agility, maybe slightly behind big data. Um, and that's because business is moving faster and faster and faster. And if you aren't transforming your business into an agile organization, you're just not going to be able to respond to the market. So Qualcomm, of course, is a technology innovator um, and a very agile company in the world of uh, communications and chipsets. 
Um, Qualcomm now uses data virtualization to satisfy all of their business intelligence reporting needs, and they implemented 36 new projects in 36 months. Think about that relative to the TDWI statistic that I said earlier in the talk about seven or eight weeks to add a new field or seven, eight, seven or eight weeks to add a new report. Pfizer, um, their BI team completely eliminated their backlog of new data requests by using composite data virtualization to deliver these data sets to requesters more quickly. They now satisfy requests 10 times faster than before, and I mean, it's almost um, funny that they've become heroes in their organization because of it. This was a real problem before, and now it's a real asset. I'll bet there's not one person listening today that uh, believes they spend too little money on data management. Right? We, all, we all spend a lot of money on this and probably feel like it's too much. So why wouldn't you embrace a technology that saves you money? Um, Northern Trust does not use uh, composite software or data virtualization on all of their projects, which means they have a good baseline to compare projects. They believe they save 80% um, on projects that they do with data virtualization than on projects that they do with a traditional um, ETL-type consolidation approach. The New York Stock Exchange believes that they saved $4 million on their first project. Uh, they created essentially a, uh, a logical um, layer that looks like a logical data warehouse above existing operational stores, and they were able to do this in not only a timely manner, but also with a cost that they believe allowed them to save that kind of money. Um, all of these companies using data virtualization love the idea that they could potentially write a smaller check to Oracle or Teradata. So as we actually look at the technology itself, this is the composite uh, data virtualization platform, and you see along the bottom all of the various types of data sources that you might need to integrate, and as most of you know, this is a mess. Right? It's different technologies, different protocols, different data shapes, um, uh, different owners of the data sources, and it's just a mess. Up at the top are a bunch of different consumers of data that want data in a particular form. And invariably, that form of data is not how it physically exists down in one or more of those physical sources. So by putting a layer in between these consumers and providers, um, you establish a semantic abstraction, a decoupling that allows you to deliver that data more easily. So, of course, the, the main product, the runtime product, is the, uh, the server itself, which is an infrastructure piece of software. Over on the left, you have development tools for um, configuring, provisioning, doing the data integration that allows you to deliver the data uh, to these consumers. And then, of course, over on the right, you have management tools that allow you to monitor, uh, manage, and scale this infrastructure on an enterprise-wide basis. So this is a uh, now a 10-year-old platform that is uh, mature to the point that it has enterprise-scale developments at very large Fortune 500 companies, and these companies are gaining the advantage of using uh, virtualization to save money increase their agility, and ultimately outpace the competition. Now, this is a short briefing, but if you want to learn more, there's lots of different ways you can do that. Um, there's, a, there's a leadership blog. There's a bunch of white papers on the composite website. There's a bunch of videos from customers on YouTube. We've got a microsite that's a, all about data virtualization, not specific to composite. There's a book that has 10 deep case studies. Uh, that book was put together uh, Composite working with an analyst to write this book on data virtualization. We have a conference every year called Data Virtualization Day uh, that allows you to have conversations with customers as well as data virtualization professionals from Composite. And there are other uh, um, assets all over the website that you can take advantage of to learn more. So I look forward to the conversation with Barry, and with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Eric. Okay, thank you so much. And we got a couple good questions in the queue already.
but folks, please don't be shy. The best way to get custom value is to ask questions. So I'm going to go ahead and hand the keys over to Barry. Devlin calling in all the way from South Africa. And Barry, just click anywhere on that slide and use the down arrow on your keyboard. And remember to speak up because your audio is kind of soft. Eric, thank you so much. Um, it is a pleasure to be calling in all the way from uh, Cape Town, uh, where it is now uh, after 10.30 at night almost. So not only am I soft, but I may also fall asleep during the presentation, but I'll try and stay awake, David. Just, just keep giving me difficult uh, things to deal with. Um, w when I was asked to, um, to speak uh, on this particular event, I thought around integration. And I thought about this concept of integration, and I came to this thought that it's a dilemma. It's a dilemma for lots of people um, because I find that when you use this word integration, everybody's always integrating something. So we have data integration, information integration, enterprise information, enterprise application integration, you name it. And everybody says it's so important, and everybody says they want to do it, and everybody's doing it. And I thought, well, maybe we should actually well, think about what it is. So what I wanted to do is to spend a couple of minutes just looking at some of the three types, what I think are three types of integration or three uses of integration in different situations. And I, I think it's important to think about this as we move into the big data era because what we're seeing here is that the need for integration is growing. So I'm going to just use some different names to name things, just not to confuse you, but to, not so we don't get confused thinking about other people's uh, wording. I'd like to talk to you first about prior integration. And that's the sort of stuff that's typically done during data warehouse population, sometimes called data integration, sometimes called ETL. And the original goal, as everybody knows these days, of data warehouse population, or in the data warehouse in, indeed itself, is consistency. And consistency is a word I'm going to come back to later because it is important. So this original goal of consistency was, was met through integration, prior integration, first of all through programming, and secondly through ETL tools. And I would suggest to you that when we did this, and we've been doing it for 20 or 30 years at this stage, um, we had a highly technical focus, and the people who were doing it had a highly technical focus on data and the processes of operational systems in order to understand how they might do this integration. And I'm saying, and maybe you'll, you'll disagree, but I think this type of integration is reducing in popularity. That's not to say we're doing less of it. We're actually probably doing more of it. But it's reducing in popularity because of the needs for the next type of integration that I'm going to talk about. So, and although it's maybe reducing in popularity, it's not going away. Then what, what David was talking about really I call immediate integration at query time. Um, and at query time basically means, as, as David said quite clearly, we're talking about timeliness we're talking about agility. And in some sense, I'm thinking, oh, I've heard this before. We heard it in the 90s. I've heard it in the 2000s. I've heard it in the 2010s. So this is probably the third time that virtualization, federation, um, yeah, immediate integration. The prodig prodigal son has returned yet again, and we're talking again and doing federation and virtualization again. And I'm not going to debate what the difference between federation and virtualization is, because that could take us the rest of the evening. But I'd like to just think of, give you the thought that, yes, where did we come from with this federation virtualization thought? Well, back in the 2000s, it was definitely about timeliness of data. But more and more, it has been driven by the big data concepts of volume and variety. It doesn't make sense to put the, all of the information into the data warehouse. Um, it, doesn't, it, doesn't feel, um, it doesn't feel right to have all that variety of data trying to push it into a relational database. So we're definitely going to have multiple data stores. We're definitely going to need to go across them and to join data from them. So this is the reason why it's growing in popularity. But it's not the only answer, I guess. So I just wanted to come back to, to Eric's uh, Where the Warehouse Ends um, title. 
because the first time I saw it, I thought, oh, is Eric trying to get me to say that the warehouse is finished? Um, this is the end of data warehousing, and I thought, I'm not killing my baby. But when I thought about it again, actually what I think is coming up here is this concept that there is a logical boundary emerging to the scope and purpose of the data warehouse. And in this um, new architecture picture that I'm showing on this slide, the data warehouse still exists. It exists in that area of core business data, of core reporting and analytic data. Um, and that particular piece of the um, information resource of the organization is a very key part of it. And it's where consistency is made to work. It's where consistency happens. And we still need to have something consistent in the middle of our organizations in order to all, do all of the good stuff, all of the exciting stuff around big data, streaming data, speciality analytics, all sorts of whatever it happens to be. So we have this uh, data warehouse ending at a boundary. But, and beyond that boundary, we have information and data or analytics and operations beyond that, where timeliness is more the key. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you can see more of this on the uh, on the link that I put on this slide. Uh, it's a white paper that I wrote a couple of months ago, and indeed um, I have a book in process which should be coming out in a few months' time, which will go under the um, interesting name I think of business unintelligence. But enough of the advertising for now. Let's go to the last slide. We have prior integration. We had immediate integration. But the, way I think I, the piece I think we're missing, and I'm glad that David brought it up here, is, is what I call concept integration. That's moving from information to data. Now, you guys are probably familiar with the phrase, from data to information, which is, the, if you like, part of the business intelligence story. But there's another piece of the story, which is from information to data. And I'd like to you to think of this, this um, concept that data is nothing more than information that's been dumbed down for computers. And in order to dumb it down, we have to understand what it is that people wanted in the beginning, the human context. And that's what information needs, or information means, I should say. So information is about the personal, subjective view of what it is I want to do on the, on the website. Data is the dumbed down version of what I actually managed to enter. If I want to integrate, I have to do integration at first conceptually at the business level through modeling, perhaps through text analytics on the fly, through some sort of um, analysis of what this data means and how it fits together. And that means focusing on common data needed for prior and immediate integration to, if you like, integrate integration. And I think that's where I would like to, to, where I'd like to see things and thinking moving over the next, uh, over the coming years. And I'm, I'm, I'm knowing that that David is sort of has hinted that something's come al coming along for the for the analyst uh, 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 desk and the the uh, integration there. But for that, that's my, if you like, input for now. I'd like to hand it back to Eric, and maybe we start uh, with the uh, with the Q and A. Oh, actually, yeah, you can just start diving in and ask questions, Barry, and you get about a 20-minute little window here to ask whatever questions of David you want, and then we'll do audience Q&A. Okay. I'm happy to do that. So I've, I've sort of touched on this already, David. You, you're, you talked about the analyst data problem. Uh, the analyst data problem, which you which you sort of said is has been around forever, forever, and I agree it's been around forever. Everybody has said it's a problem for the analyst to figure out what the data is, how does it fit together, what does it mean. So it's been around forever, and everybody has claimed to tackle it at one time or another. So my question is really, why would Composite succeed where all the others have failed? <laughs> That's a very fair question, Barry, and um, I think that uh, we come at these problems in a variety of ways over time, and ultimately um, we wear them down and, and hopefully bring some technology to the table that actually solves it. Um, I think what's different about bringing uh, some form of data virtualization uh, to bear on this problem is the idea of uh, lighter weight, uh, more immediate integration, and the ability to 
uh, work almost at a meta layer rather than in the actual physical uh, movement and integration of the data. Um, in, in some sense, as an analyst works, they're dealing with um, bits of data from a variety of places, and they want to bring those together as quickly as possible, even if they're messy, even if it, they don't understand what the correlation is among the different sets, but to be able to bring them together quickly and look at them and, and play with them, that kind of agility is something that they just don't have today. And, and we believe that virtualization as a core technology can assist with that problem. Now, there's some things we need to layer on top of that to make it easier to use, make it manageable, make it, um, you know, so that it's not just the Wild West out there, and, and we're working on some of those things. But I think that's what makes it different from uh, uh, attempts to solve this before. So let me try and understand, make sure that I've got you there. So you're saying, first of all, it's about working at a, a, a conceptual level in terms of what does that mean for the business in business terms, is that correct? Yes, um, that's one of the components of it. Um, so that's working in, as an analyst, if you're, if you're looking at your problem, one of the first things you say is um, what, uh, what, what data sets would make solving this problem easier? And so in some ways, that's where you're asking about the conceptual business data that you need in order to solve this problem. Okay. And then the second piece is going out and playing with the actual data through virtualization. Is that correct? Yes. It's the um, sort of marshalling of all these protocols and um, being able to bring things together quickly. There's, there's a terminology that um, analysts use a lot called fail fast which is if they're going to hit at that end, they want to hit it as quickly as possible. So being able to bring data together and actually manipulate it very quickly in a very lightweight way um, adds to their success. Okay, okay. So, so that brings me to a phrase you, you sort of used in, in your presentation, which was self-service data integration. And I think that worries me even more than self-service BI. Um, because I've seen some of what business users do with self-service BI. Do you really think business users can do this? Can they do it well? And how can you help them to do it? So, um, yeah, let's let's make some dif distinctions here because you're right. It, it should be a little scary to um, uh, data management professionals. Um, the truth is these analysts are doing it today. They're already doing self-service integration. They're doing it by walking down the hall and asking their fellow analyst for a spreadsheet that was a data dump six months ago. They're doing it by uh, talking to their a colleague on the phone and somehow getting access to this uh, data mart that somebody else is using in marketing. So they're actually already doing self-service integration. They're just doing it in a very inefficient, very messy, very uncontrolled, and unmonitored way. So one of the things we believe we can bring to the table is to make that self-service data integration easier, but also to give data management professionals some visibility and maybe eventually some control over how this data is used such that it's um, less uh, wild west out there with the proliferation of spread marts and old data sets and you know, SQL Server databases under the table that analysts eventually ask IT to manage. So I think that it's not that we want analysts to integrate data for use by the rest of the enterprise. That's clearly a data management um, practice. But for analysts to be able to integrate data for themselves for a particular purpose, they're already doing it. We just want to make it easier for them to do it. Okay, I, I, I guess I have to agree with you on that because I've certainly seen, the, seen it happen. It still worries me, but it happens. And I'm, I'd, I'd like to segue from there into your, your concepts of the analytic sandbox and the analytic data hub. Um, so I'm, I understand conceptually the, the distinction you're making between the two, um, and I think you've just sort of described that again in what you've said. But in implementation terms, they seem very similar in terms of the tools and so on. So, or maybe even identical. So, can you give me some some clarification on how these 
two components would be different at a at a physical implementation level? Yes, although at the physical implementation level, they are very similar. Um, ultimately, these data sets are um, either virtual or physically consolidated, um, whether it's done through virtualization or through traditional means like ETL and brought together in a sandbox. So physically, um, these, these data sets to serve analysts may look the same whether they're part of a centralized analytic hub or whether it's uh, something that an analyst might do on their desktop. I think the main difference, though, um, is as an analyst works, they're not concerned with reusability, they're not concerned with durability, shareability, any of the things that might make this an asset for the enterprise through time. What they're concerned about is getting an answer, and they will churn and throw things away willy-nilly in order to do that. An analytic data hub is a place where the, uh, the results and the um, data sets that analysts ultimately uh, feel have given them some value have a place to live where they can be governed, where they can be documented, and ultimately shared and institutionalized with the rest of the organization. So it becomes more of a durable asset that the organization invests in and maintains over time. You're right that physically they look a lot the same. It's data in a, in a data storage mechanism or data that streams to a tool that you can use for analytics. But over time, um, one of them becomes a corporate asset. The other one might get thrown away. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Now, personally, I tend to position, you, you know, I think you're talking a little bit here about consistency and agility and the two sides of it, sort of agility in order to do, to figure out what it is is needed in the analytic sandbox and a level of consistency when you start productionalizing this stuff through IT. So I tend to position, roughly speaking, ETL for consistency and data virtualization for agility. And I'm just wondering, and I see they need to fit, fit together. They need to use the common, common metadata, common approaches. They need to have the same model underneath them. I mean, does Composite have any function or, or perhaps even plans that you might be willing to talk about that would drive enhanced data consistency in a virtualized environment? So first, I, I agree with you in general that um, if, if your data needs to be um, cleansed and uh, you want to invest in a different form of data that's a durable copy of that data, like for example, a data warehouse or an MDM hub, um, then ETL has been and will continue to be um, a good form of integration to accomplish those things. And virtualization, accessing live data from operational and even transactional sources uh, tends to be looked at as more um, uh, unblessed, if you will, and, and the unwashed masses. But having said that, one of the things that you start to do with virtualization over time is realize that it's a veneer over all of your data. And so just as much access to the warehouse is done through data virtualization as is done to operational sources. And master data management hubs are really not nearly as useful unless you layer data virtualization on top of them to allow you to bring in the details of those master records from the various sources. So although it looks a little bit black and white that you're either going to have consistent and cleansed and blessed data that you've moved using ETL into the warehouse, or you're going to have live, unwashed uh, data using uh, data virtualization, in actuality, uh, data virtualization becomes a way to leverage all of your data, some of which will be unwashed, some of which will be washed, and leverage it for better business use. Now, to get to your specific question, do we have any mechanisms to actually um, do that kind of cleansing and or transformation or enrichment? We have a lot of mechanisms to do that. And in fact, um, a lot of uh, data transformation, formatting, um, enrichment, standardization is done through the data virtualization layer as data passes through it. Um, in the end, what you have to look at are the trade-offs between how much time does this take to do on the fly 
and should we make it durable somewhere? Now, one of the trends we see is that it doesn't always have to be made durable in a derived source like a warehouse or an MDM hub. A lot of companies are now pushing that data quality, if you will, back to the creation of data so that the data is correct from the beginning and has the ability to be used much more immediately than if uh, you did a full um, uh, data quality ETL transformation on it as it moved to a warehouse. Mm -hmm. This is Eric. I threw up um, a couple slides from a previous presentation because we had some attendees asking for more granular detail on exactly how some of this stuff works. And I think that, Barry, where you're going with some of these questions, you're asking some of those kinds of, of queries. So just for example, we've got a, a question from an attendee basically asking, well, how long does it take you at Composite to map to some of these different data sources? And does it, take, does it take you less time than it would take our existing data warehouse team? And I think the, the general answer is yes, but maybe I'm going to push this um, slide here for a moment because uh, I think it gives a pretty good perspective on how you can break down the different layers of abstraction. David, do you mind taking a look at this and just kind of commenting on this and using it as a metaphor to explain how this abstraction layer allows greater agility in being able to provision data to different users? Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, let's focus, it, and, and by the way, all four of these layers in the blue boxes uh, exist in the data virtualization layer, uh, and yet they are conceptually very different layers of integration. If you focus in on that one that's labeled business layer for a moment, um, these are essentially the forms of data that serve the business best and define the data that runs the business. And this is usually what we were trying to accomplish in the data warehouse, is creating these um, business canonicals that would allow us to do better reporting, better monitoring, better visibility. Um, the challenge when you do this in a physical warehouse is that it's a physical form that is very, um, uh, brittle in the sense that it's difficult to change. If you look at the layers here, as the data, um, as the metadata comes in from the bottom, you essentially have what form of this data uh, exists as a physical uh, database. You then can do a bunch of different formatting and name changes and standardization and enrichment, and ultimately you get up to that business layer. But what always happens, even when you get to those canonicals, is that some consumer needs that data in a slightly different form. This is how we got derivative data marts, right? And so by having another layer on top of these canonicals in the virtualization layer, you can do very lightweight mapping to serve specific consumers. And so it almost looks like an hourglass where the mess at the bottom gets marshaled into these business canonicals in that business layer, but then also stands back out when you have different types of consumers that need data in slightly different forms. So doing this with metadata and dragging and dropping it with a visual interface is much more agile than doing this by actually standing up a physical silo, implementing a schema, writing ETL scripts to populate that schema, and then, lo and behold, trying to change it. Mm -hmm. uh, Go ahead, I think we're, Go ahead. We're, we're coming back to the agility versus consistency thing, and I'm not trying to do, a, you know, put pit one against the other, because David, I absolutely agree that there is a need for agility. That something like data virtualization layered over the top of um, a the data warehouse and the data marts and the operational systems and the big data systems and whatever it happens to be, that data virtualization absolutely does that agility. What I really feel is that there's still a need for pieces of information, consistent business information that we say, you know what, this is the correct set of, <clears throat> excuse me, the correct set of information to be used for reporting to the, uh, to the IRS. Um, yes. and you I, I completely agree with you. Yeah, I completely yeah. agree with you, Barry. And, and what's interesting is um, because this is a continuum, from you know the unwashed direct access to the um, cleanse and, and bless data that you can report to the IRS. Um, the challenge is 
um, where on that continuum does your current problem lie? Uh, when is data from an operational store good enough to solve your problem? And when is data from the uh, blessed and audited source a necessity? One of the things that virtualization does, and, and by the way, you mentioned earlier that we won't discuss the difference between federation and virtualization, but this is a place where it makes sense. If you think of virtualization as an overlay, part of what you do in your practice of using that virtualization is decide which data makes sense for the current problem. You may be accessing data from your um, audited warehouse data. You may be accessing it from your operational or even your transactional data. But you have the flexibility if you have this virtual overlay to access all of those in, uh, for, to solve the problem that makes sense right now. And sometimes it's that flexibility that makes a difference between actually getting the answer soon enough and not. Mm -hmm. We've got a bunch of really good comments from the audience here, so I'm going to just dive right in. And Barry, feel free to chime in again uh, as you see fit. So here's just an interesting comment from an attendee who writes, I cannot see any shortcuts past bona fide ETL in any of these new products. Of course, you guys aren't new, but uh, they promised artificial intelligence, but I fear they mean more programming in IT. And it, you were just kind of addressing this from a slightly different perspective, but I think um, maybe you could kind of get into how data virtualization enables this greater agility, but also can include the kinds of guardrails to preserve the consistency that Barry was talking about and I'll throw another question out, and sorry to give you two ones complicated like that, but one of the other attendees asked, um, who manages the metadata in composite software, and how is that done? Because I think that is the, the glue through which you gain that consistency but still get more agility, right? Yes, and, and I think that the key to, to both of these um, questions, Eric, is data virtualization does not replace the warehouse. Data virtualization does not replace ETL. Data virtualization is another tool in your arsenal to solve problems that are emerging and making it difficult uh, to solve those problems using only ETL or only a warehouse. And so in the end, there's a collection of tools here. Now, because of that, ultimately this is data management. And just as you have a data management team who do stewardship, governance, initially do modeling as part of creating a warehouse, those same data management professionals are in charge of doing the same thing in the data virtualization domain. And so the canonicals that get created in data virtualization are very much like the canonicals we all hope to create um, and some have managed to be successful in creating in the warehouse. Um, but it's that control and those best practices that have to extend to this more on-demand, agile environment as we move forward. Now, you know, the, the, uh, one of the comments was that um, you don't see any advantage uh, in functionality over uh, something like ETL. And at the end of the day, um, in some sense, there's some correctness in that statement in that all we're trying to do is take data in whatever form it exists and deliver it to some consumer the way they need it. Now, whether you do that by extracting it, transforming it, and loading it into some other silo, or you do that by dragging right. and dropping some graphical elements and delivering it as a stream, that matters less than when you're really transforming it to give it to the consumer in a way that makes sense. We believe that there's a lot of use cases where data virtualization can do that with more agility than uh, ETL and physical consolidation can deliver it. Yeah, good, could, could that's I, a good answer. Could I oh, go ahead, in? Mary. Go ahead. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, just chime in quickly there. I mean, yeah, absolutely. In in terms of virtualization, agility is 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 the, the key driver, I think. But I'm interested in the fact that when you think about this mapping and this this the the creation of these um, canonicals, essentially they should be the same canonicals whether you're doing ETL or whether you're doing data virtualization. Otherwise, you've got a data yes. consistency yes. problem. So I think yes. you've got to yes. figure a way to use this work that analysts are doing in the analytic sandbox or the IT guys are doing in the back room in IT 
in, in ETL and bring the two together so that we can actually benefit from them. So it's not just another two silos of, of tools that we use. Well, I think that's right, Barry. And in fact, um, none of our customers treat um, data virtualization as a separate silo uh, from their data management practice in the long term. Almost all of them will start on a project basis, you know, so it looks like a silo to start because they want to make sure that they're comfortable with the technology. But over time, um, these actually blend into a um, a very symbiotic approach to data management, very much like the picture you drew on slide 33, where you have the um, the warehouse and maybe some MDM at the core, but you have all of this other satellite data around it, and then you have an overlay. Um, you know, Gartner describes this as a logical data warehouse instead of a physical data warehouse, and I think that that's the direction that most enterprises are moving that the, the physical integration and those canonicals is still an important component of this, but it becomes um, uh, symbiotic and, and sort of uh, you gain synergies with the rest of your data by having this agile overlay that allows you to use both, allows you to use either, uh, depending on the situation. Yeah, that's a great point. And by the way, Barry, I was doing a silent cheer when you when you put this slide up and talked about the concept of where the sidewalk ends, because that's exactly right. The idea of the title is not that the data warehouse is going away, but that there is a logical end to the data warehouse, and beyond that is where you explore other means for provisioning data and cleansing data and so on and so forth. And we have a bunch of more questions. I'll try to get to as many of these as we can folks, but if you feel a question was not answered, by all means, uh, ping us with an email or we'll get you directly to the folks at Composite or to Barry, who I'm sure would be happy to, uh, to offer some information. So here is a, a really good question, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, David, but basically the, the question is, is your environment aware of performance? And I guess, just from my past experience with you guys, the answer is absolutely yes. In other words, the Composite system can tell how quickly it gets data from this spinning disk versus that solid state disk versus this other source. And really, you guys have focused very heavily on trying to refine that optimizer, as you call it, right? That's correct. And in fact, um, you know, let me first say that we are bound, uh, unfortunately, by the laws of physics here. And moving too much data in real time will not perform. And so um, our uh, core intellectual property is focused on algorithms for doing uh, optimized, federated data access in a way that reduces the amount of data that needs to be moved in order to answer the current question. It turns out, um, although the questioner asked about spinning disks and network latency, it turns out that most of the time, the long pole in the tent is the volume of data that needs to be moved across the network. And so if we can reduce that by orders of magnitude, then the virtualized um, response will meet your SLA. But having said that, that's why we still believe that this is a combination of approaches. There's a continuum between live access and fully consolidated prior integration, as Barry describes. And that continuum can be addressed by caching, by some other integration through ETL, but the point is when you put a virtual layer above all of this, you get to separate the problem of what's the right data from the problem of how do I deliver that data to meet an SLA. That's right. And here's another really good question from an attendee. What is the shape of the models designed by your users? Are they like multidimensional models, ontologies? I guess they could be any number of different ways, but can you kind of speak to that modeling complexity or variety? It's a good question. Um, there are multiple data shapes represented in the virtualization layer. So you have tabular data and you have hierarchical data and scalar data. And then, of course, you can combine uh, data into uh, higher level models um, that may look like traditional um, uh, denormalized schemas. They, uh, they might look like um, uh, multidimensional in the sense that they're uh, starflake or, I'm sorry, snowflake or star schemas. Um, now, when you get up to the point where you're actually building a cube 
and you have an analytic tool that's accessing that cube, there's often a tight coupling between those two things. Um, SAS is an example. Um, TIBCO Spotfire is an example. And, and we don't generally slide in between that, where you're modeling a three-dimensional cube in data virtualization. We don't have multi-dimensional semantics as part of the modeling. But what we can do is we can provide data to those multi-dimensional environments in a form that makes it easy to build those cubes. So as you, as you bubble data up through the virtualization layer, um, you can expose it as tabular data with models as rich as you've seen in um, relational databases like rollout models. And you can also expose it as um, hierarchical XML data and expose it as web services, both as REST and SOAP. Um, but if you want to actually build cubes, you're generally doing that above this layer. Okay, good. We got a couple more good questions here. Um, here's one: uh, the analytic hubs that you talked about—they uh, don't need to be 100% virtual, right? You can create physical copies when needed. That's correct. And you know, a minute ago I talked about this continuum between uh, fully live data or prior uh, integrated data, and this materialization of part of the data. Um, the part of the data that may take a long time to materialize or the part of the data that you really need to um, uh, have perform well or maybe has very deep transformations in it. But you can then combine that data with, with live data. So you can actually achieve a combination of consolidated and live data by uh, using a granular approach to which data gets integrated in what manner. Okay, good. Here's another specific question, um, an attendee asks, you know, data virtualization can increase server load on native databases, so how does Composite avoid that kind of IT burden? Well, yeah. that's, a, that's a really good question, and it's, a, and it's a question that all of our customers ask us. Um, I will say that different customers deal with it differently. Um, ultimately, by having live queries go to operational or even transactional sources, you are increasing the load on those sources. Now, you can remove some of that load by doing some caching. We've already talked about caching here, and that's a way to remove some of the load. But ultimately, the load's going to exist somewhere. Some of our customers will focus this on beefing up their operational platforms to manage what ultimately is moving more towards a real-time or on-demand business flow. And so rather than investing in technology that is yet another silo to handle that load, they're actually investing in the data store itself to handle both the existing operational load and the new load that might come from virtualization. Mm -hmm. And here I'll throw a couple last curveballs at you. One, I love questions like this. Are there any scenarios where this product has little or no benefit? Absolutely. Well, that's that's a really, I mean, it's important to talk about where this doesn't make sense. Um, there, are, there are a lot of times when you actually want to create a derived form of data and invest in it as a durable asset through time. Um, again, a, a master data uh, hub is a good example of this, where you want to create a customer master or a supplier master and invest and maintain that through time. That's really not a good place to use virtualization. Now, virtualization can help in the construction of that, but ultimately that's going to be a, uh, a, a durable data asset that exists outside of virtualization. Um, and, and likewise, um, data warehouses continue to be an important focus for data management. So it's, it's as I said a couple of times now, it's another tool in your toolbox, and just like you would not use a hammer to, uh, to put a screw into a piece of wood, um, you would not use a screwdriver to put a nail into a piece of wood. And so you just have to pick what's the right technology for the form of data integration you need for this particular use case. Okay, good. And uh, okay, just two more. <laughs> We're getting some good ones late in the game here. Um, what about disaster recovery, a disaster situation? Can this be? Can can a composite instance be shut down, and then when, when it comes back online, how do you reconcile with anything that may have changed? I guess. Yeah. So um, let's see. We we could spend quite a bit of time on that one. So let me try to give a brief answer. 
Um, the data virtualization platform is um, is an enterprise class uh, infrastructure software that is made to scale and to be durable for high availability. Now, having said that, one of the nice things about um, data virtualization is we don't actually store the data. The data passes through us. Sometimes it goes to a cache. Sometimes it goes directly to the consumer. But we don't actually store it. And so the, um, the only thing that's actually durable in the data virtualization layer is metadata. And that metadata, of course, is backed up and archived and versioned just like any other um, programmed asset in your enterprise. But if a uh, composite um, data virtualization um, uh, cluster goes down because of some kind of disaster, it's very easy to just bring it back up and, and get it operational again, even if it's in a different location, because really what we're dealing with here is metadata versus actual stored data. Okay, good. And folks, we burned through 67 minutes, almost 70 minutes, as usual, a wonderful show today. Very, very big thank you to Mr. Bessemer for bringing us uh, this good information. Very, a lot of thanks to Barry Devlin calling in all the way from South Africa. Thanks so much for that one. Send us the bill on the phone, <laughs> on the phone bill, Barry. And uh, well, here yeah, we, archive, we archive all these webcasts for later viewing, so hop online to insideanalysis.com. Look under the webcast section, and you can navigate your way to the briefing room. We've got another briefing room next week, and then another Hot Technologies next week as well. That's one of our new shows uh, where we try to distill some of the marketing buzz that you see out there. So be sure to check that out. And with that, we're going to bid you farewell, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in once again. We really appreciate your time and attention. You can always email yours truly. You should get an email from me promoting these events and let me know what you think of them. And let me know if you think of uh, topics you'd like us to cover next year. We're already planning the 2014 Briefing Room Editorial Calendar, believe it or not. So with that, we're going to bid you farewell, folks, and thank you again so much. We'll catch up to you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.